Well, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Lauren Levine. Uh, most of you know me as the Digital Dentist. I wanted to welcome you all to tonight's webinar. Uh, as of this morning, we had almost 450 people that were registered for the webinar. I think it's just, it really shows uh, the interest in this topic, and, and a, a good chunk of you are already uh, here. I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking so that we make sure that Dr. Elliott can speak for as long as she'd like. Uh, we also want to make sure that we leave time for any questions. All of you on your screen should have a little go to webinar control panel. Go ahead and type in your questions as you think about them. Depending on where we're at in the presentation, we may not be able to get to them until the very end. But as you think about them, just go ahead and type them in, and I'll do my best to make sure that we get to all of those, those questions before the, the evening is done. By the next week, you should all get a number of things. When you log out tonight, just indicate would you like Dr. Elliott to follow up with you, whether you want me to follow up with you. Uh, that will just be a short little two-question survey there. Uh, also, many of you know that I do record these webinars. So uh, within a day or two, you are going to get an email with a link that you can download the entire presentation. So don't worry if you have to take a phone call or, you know, the kids are screaming or whatever. Don't, we're going to get, uh, you know, make sure that you have uh, the whole presentation to listen to when you'd like. Um, also, I want to thank our sponsor tonight, which is Golden Dental Solutions. Uh, they have graciously agreed to provide an hour and a half of continuing education credit for, for everyone. Many of you are probably familiar with Golden Dental because we've done a number of webinars uh, with them in the past on, on the physics forceps uh, and other products, and uh, they're going to be coming on later on tonight to, to offer a, a special uh, deal for everyone as well. So many of you uh, already know me. Uh, I am known as a digital dentist. I did practice uh, as a periodontist for 10 years. Um, what I've been doing over the last few years is to present webinars that are topics of interest, even if they're not necessarily in my area of expertise, which is technology. Really the goal with these courses is to provide content that I think is interesting and stimulating, you know, maybe a little controversial, but hopefully beneficial. And I think we're going to really hit on all of those uh, topics tonight. You know, as dentists, we're constantly looking for ways that we can improve our practices, looking at new things that we can do. And this is really the focus of a lot of webinars I've done over the last year or so. Yeah, many of you have been on some of my previous webinars where we talked about physics forceps, where general dentists are now handling tough extractions or six-month smiles, doing uh, short-term ortho. And I think sleep apnea, sleep medicine really falls into that area because dentists can definitely play a role. You know, as many of you probably know, if it's left untreated, it can cause all kinds of problems, heart failure, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes. So I really think this is a great tool, a great service that we can provide our patients as long as we have the, the training and, and the knowledge to be able to do that. Now, as much as I would love to talk about sleep apnea until uh, the cows come home, uh, you know, the, the fact is I don't know much about it. Uh, my role really is, is as a moderator tonight. You know, it's interesting that as a speaker, as a consultant, I'm out there a lot, and I talk to a lot of dentists, a lot of other consultants, so we get to hear when there are new rising stars in our, in our field. And Dr. Elliott, I'd heard about her for a few months. I had the pleasure of meeting her at a social event at the Greater New York meeting back in the uh, end of November. I was just so impressed with the passion that she brings uh, to this topic and how she has helped so many of her patients with it. And I said to her, you know, I think this would be a great webinar topic. Uh, and she graciously agreed to come on. Uh, she is a practicing general dentist with a private practice. She's in Post Falls, Idaho. She does a lot of things other than sleep apnea. She practices general dentistry, cosmetic dentistry, ortho, but definitely sleep apnea is, is where she's becoming a real expert. She's an active member of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. She's authored several articles on dental sleep medicine, including her latest article, which was in the October uh, issue of Dental Economics. It was called time to, uh, Take the Time to Check for Sleep Apnea. She's considered a national expert in this growing field of dentistry, and she's lectured extensively educating dentists on how to incorporate dental sleep medicine into their practices. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone and the screen over to her. And welcome, Erin. It was a pleasure to have you tonight, and we're really looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Levine. I'm looking forward to... Um sharing with everybody the passion I have for not only helping my patients, but in helping other dentists um, help their patients as well. Like you said, I practice in Post Falls, Idaho, which actually has a population of 27,000. So m like many of you, I don't practice in a big metropolis with um, 
thousands and thousands of patients around. Our county actually has about 125,000 and two sleep labs and three sleep physicians that I work with very closely. And it didn't happen overnight. Um, it's something that I started about three and a half years ago and since then have really taken it as part as, as a whole other part of my practice. Uh, within Post Falls Family Dental, I have Sleep Better Northwest and a dental sleep medicine coordinator that actually handles a lot of, of the administrative staff and as well as some follow-up appointments while I'm still practicing general dentistry. In fact, today I did occlusals on four-year-olds and an extraction on a 60-year-old using the physics forceps, of course, and just kind of do everything to help um, serve the families of Kootenai County. So dental sleep medicine is Really We're not seeing your screen kind of yet, Erin, so I don't know if you've uh, clicked the button oh. yet. So, uh, okay. Sorry about that. The presentation always goes a lot better when we can see <laughs> the screen. There we go. Sorry about that. There's my practice Perfect. in post files. Um, so recently, of course, we see in, in the news, this was actually when I traveled to the Greater New York meeting. On the way there, I took Delta. And there was an article in the in-flight magazine about sleep. On the way home, I took Alaska. And there was an article about sleep. It affects a lot of Americans because, really, we don't get enough sleep with all the electronics we use and caffeinated beverages and sleep aids. There's so much that we're missing in our um, sleep. You can see that's the, now even in the news we see um, every week I see different news press releases about dental sleep or obstructive sleep apnea and the effects it has on our health. This one just came out this summer in which um, <clears throat> patients are five times more likely to die from cancer. And so it really affects a lot of us. It's important because there are four stages to our sleep. And that includes this deep sleep and REM sleep that we, we know about where we sleep or where we dream. If interrupted, we don't get the restful sleep we need. And with already surviving on too little sleep, we aren't getting the hormone regulation. Our body's not resting. Our cells aren't regenerating and healing. And it has a huge economic impact as far as untreated sleep apnex using twice the amount of healthcare dollars. So there are about 84 different sleep disorders, and the ones that the dentists concentrate on, of course, are the sleep disorder breathing category. Uh, other categories include uh, sleepwalking, sleep talking, uh, something called REM behavior disorder. My patient actually just got diagnosed with that last week in which she was acting out her dreams. So fortunately, she's safe and her husband's safe. She was uh, actually going after him in her dreams. Uh, so with the snoring, um, of course we all know about snoring, and it's not really a joke, even though we like to joke about it. Upper airway resistance syndrome is when patients are snoring, and they're constantly getting interrupted because of the snoring, whether it be an elbow from their wife or an arousal from a deep sleep into a lighter stage of sleep. Uh, most These are the people that wake up unrested. Central sleep apnea is a category of sleep apnea that's actually pretty rare. Uh, that's when our brain tells us not to breathe. And so, you know, we have two different types of sleep apnea that we deal with, and obstructive is the one that the dentist can treat because there's an actual physical blockage affecting our sleep pattern. So going in more into snoring, uh, I guess recently, due to my cold, um, I have been snoring more lately, and my husband sent this to me on our Facebook account with love, of course. And so he has resorted to this occasionally, the pillow technique. And like I said, we see it in the cartoons, in articles, on the news, and a lot of the population snores. But many people tell me they don't snore, but then when I talk to their wife or husband, I hear the real truth. Most of the time, when I ask if somebody snores, they say, no, I don't. I sleep just fine. I don't snore. But my wife tells me I do. I thought it was interesting that a lot of the custom-built homes that are coming, uh, that are being built, actually are going to have two separate master bedrooms. And that's already started in Europe. They're called snore rooms. So it has become a pretty um, common thing 
uh, snoring occurs when there's a narrowing of the airway and vibration of the soft tissue. And that can be in the nasal component or in the back of the throat. As we exist, there's a continuum of snoring, especially as we age or start gaining weight. And you know, as we age, we lose muscle tone. So our normal sleeping becomes a non-sleepy snorer. And like I said, that upper airway resistance syndrome is when we're interrupted enough that we don't get restful sleep, we become a sleepy snorer. And eventually, obstructive sleep apnea is diagnosed. Obstructive sleep apnea is where there's repetitive episodes of apnea, which means cessation of, of airflow or without breath. And the difference between central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea is when there's actually ventilatory efforts. It's when we're trying, trying to breathe, but we can't because there's a blockage. So as you can see, when we lay down supine on our back, um, we normally maintain an airway and <clears throat> with a soft palate and uvula allowing us to, to breathe. Now with snoring, there's a pr uh, partial obstruction of the airway. And like I said, the nasal cavity, the soft tissue there could be vibra vibrating. There could be a narrowing there uh, or the soft tissue and uvula area. And then an apnea occurs, obstructive sleep apnea occurs when there's a complete blockage and our oxygen desaturates. So as we become increasingly obstructed, that is called a hypopnea. Hypopnea means that there is basically like a little kink in the hose. The airway is narrowed enough that um, we actually, our oxygen desaturates 4% or more. Now with apnea, we have a complete obstruction of 10 seconds or more, and our oxygen desaturates. So we kind of get into this continuum of this pattern uh, where we fall asleep, sometimes pretty easily, sometimes it takes us a while. And as our muscles relax, the soft tissue relaxes, the tissue vibrates, and the tissue actually collapses. That snoring is the vibration. And then it narrows enough to the point of collapse. And we have an apnea. Now, hypercapnia, if you remember, is a buildup of CO2. And CO2 is actually what causes our brain to breathe. It's, it's the reaction the brain has to CO2 rather than oxygen that tells our body to breathe. So once we um, realize that, our brain sends a little um, activator, a little squirt of adrenaline. And that is a smooth muscle contractor that gets the airway open again. So we can grab a few breaths, breathing resumes, we relax again, and go to sleep. And the whole system starts over again. And you wonder why we're tired. This is, a video. this is a video of a man having an apneic event. And as you can see here, he's trying to breathe, trying to breathe. He's not actually, he's quiet, but it's because he has an obstruction. There's no airflow. And he's still continuing to try to breathe. You can do it, buddy. Now, I guarantee you, if you tried to do that even being awake, it would be difficult to hold your breath that long. And it's, it's like holding the, your breath at the bottom of the swimming pool. Your body's going to do anything you can to try to get that air. So sometimes we gasp, or our leg kicks, or we grind our teeth together, um, whatever it takes for that brain to get that, the diaphragm moving again. And it's almost worse than the, and you know, being in the, holding your breath under the water because if you see, he started getting that obstruction right at the end of the breath, at the expiration. 
So trying to release all the air out of your lungs and then hold your breath for that long, you can see why most people don't wake up refreshed. The typical signs and symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea um, are, of course, obesity. We have a huge obesity problem in um, America. As, uh, as we see the census you know, every year changing, we have new, more categories of um, obesity, which is really scary for our health care. You know. And then with snoring, uh, that's just basically preapnea. That is usually the chief complaint that brings people in. Uh, most of the time when people come in for a consult, it's because their um, wife or husband forced them to. And a lot of times it is fatigue and daytime sleepiness. The chief complaint usually is snoring. In fragmented or light sleep, a lot of people who have trouble sleeping or say they have insomnia, it can be related to obstructive sleep apnea. And the most telltale sign really is when a wife or husband tells us they have to nudge their spouse to start breathing again, that they get scared that um, something's going to happen to them when they sleep. Again, our memory and learning takes place during that REM sleep. And if we never reach that, we're going to have poor mem memory. Morning headaches from oxygen depletion. Uh, a lot of times when people complain to us about headaches, we think TMJ uh, kind of begs the question to maybe ask them about their sleep. And of course, if someone's grumpy, their family's not going to like being around them. Uh, the nocturnal enuresis basically is a fancy word for getting up and using the restroom often in the night. And the reason why I included that is because I never realized how common it was until I started talking to my patients about it. My hygienist husband, actually, uh, we treated him. And she tells me all the time how, um, how much lower their water bill is now because he always thought he had a bad prostate and had to get up four or five times a night. But that little squirt of adrenaline that your pituitary gland allows the release of um, actually can get our bladder moving, too. So why would we want to treat it? Uh, like Dr. Levine said, where there's a lot of health consequences. And especially as dentists, we are a lot more than just you know, people who cut on enamel rods with uh, treating perio. Uh, we see that there's quite a link between the oral mouth or the oral cavity and the whole body. So with strokes, um, we see 80% of the nocturnal stroke victims had untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Heart attacks, you have a 30% um, higher chance of having a heart attack. And dementia, when they tested people um, in the Alzheimer's ward, they actually found that 90% of them had untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Acid reflux, hypertension, especially patients whose hypertension is not controlled even with medication. 83% uh, of those patients have um, obstructive sleep apnea. As well as cancer, I showed you that news release of that new study that they're five times more likely to die. And of course, it's related to obesity. Uh, I think it's kind of a vicious cycle because you know, when you're tired and not feeling good, you're not really going to want to get up and go to the gym. But in addition, the sleep cycle is where those um, appetite suppressant hormones are released and our hunger hormones are released. So if we're not getting the proper regulation, I just don't think we're motivated to eat right. Diabetes, that's when, again, sleep is when those hormones are regulated. Uh, you're two and a half times more likely to have diabetes if you have obstructive sleep apnea. And with auto accidents, um, just as, just, drowsy drivers are just as dangerous as drunk drivers. In fact, they found that um, the car accidents that drowsy drivers get in are five times more serious or fatal. And of course, if we're not sleeping, we're not feeling good. And the only reason I included this one is because even my six-year-old knows that Cialis is for daily use. I think by, you know, I don't talk to my patients a lot about this, and they don't really admit it, but it has a huge effect. The oxygen um, in our bodies and, and the lack of has a huge effect in this area. And <clears throat> it's something we don't talk about, but it's obviously out there because I hear a commercial or see a commercial probably five times a day. And 
we even that this is Reggie White. His wife is actually a spokesman for sleep apnea now, trying to help low-income people get diagnosed as well as treated. Uh, he, if you remember, he died in his sleep, and they never say that the patient died from sleep apnea. It's usually heart failure or natural causes. But dying at 50 of heart failure is not real natural, in my opinion. Uh, death is, or sleep is where we're supposed to be resting, not dying. So how do we get diagnosed? That's the first step. Uh, it must be made by a sleep physician. And we get that by doing a sleep study. Uh, most common is the PSG, or polysomnograph, in which you go to a sleep lab. And they're actually really comfortable. Uh, I have one that is in a hospital and one that is an actual sleep lab. And it's a little bit like a hotel, TV, and kind of the amenities of home. And you're allowed to bring your own pillow. And uh, But this is what we, they do. We, there's a lot of wires. But we test for a lot, or they test for a lot of things. Uh, there's wires attached to your heart for EKG near your eyes to test for uh, REM, which is rapid eye movement. Uh, brain waves, as well as uh, muscle channels on your chin, so it tests for bruxing, as well as on your legs to test for restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movements, which is uh, leg kicks, which is pretty common with sleep apnea as well. And then, of course, nasal flow, pulse, um, oxygen. And they can test more than just sleep apnea, because there are many different disorders. It is technician assisted. This is actually my dental sleep medicine coordinator right here. Uh, she makes the best coordinator because she actually has sleep apnea herself and really can't sleep without her oral appliance. So she is great to speak with the patients and uh, really identifies with them. So the technician sets it up. And in my opinion, it's a nice night away from home. I actually had one as well. And I thought, wow, this is great. I get to hold the remote, and my husband's not, you know, pestering me to mess around. So then they, re they spit out a report. And I know this looks really confusing, and it looks like a bunch of squiggles. But when you enter dental, dental sleep medicine world, you'll see that, you know, you will be able to read what this means and um, interpret, help interpret it for your patients. This is a typical obstructive sleep apnea. And you can see here, this is his chin movement. So bruxing can be associated with um, obstructive sleep apnea as well. In addition, there are home sleep tests that are becoming more and more common. Because more patients aren't wanting to go to a, a sleep lab, they're more resistant to seeking treatment, uh, more and more sleep physicians are open to home sleep testing. In addition, um, if there are no comorbidities and it, there are no other possible sleep disorders, that obstructive sleep apnea is what is assumed they have, then we can do a home, or the sleep physicians will do a home sleep study. This is just one type. Um, the type four just means that there's two channels that are measured, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Type two is basically a PSG at home. There is no technician, and there's, but there's still all those leads and wires. And type three is similar to what you see here. There's a respiratory belt, as well as this is the reader here, and a nasal cannula to study oxygen flow. This is another type in which you just wear it on the head. And it can test sleep posi uh, position, airflow, um, pulse, and the oxygen saturations of your blood. But it does rely on the patient's place. And sometimes they can't get it right. I know my um, in-laws were visiting, and they did a home sleep test. And I had explained it to them, but still had to touch them, or still had to help them. OK, now this is the type 4 I was talking about, in which only two channels are um, red. And many patients, when I ask them about if they snore, if they possibly have sleep apnea, and I can see a lot of the signs, uh, they said, oh, well, I was tested, and I don't have it. Well, I ask them what kind of test they had, and it's usually they say they wore something on their fingers. And it's real common for primary care physicians to send their patients home with this just to test them. But it's going to not really show you if you have mild or moderate sleep apnea. 
it's mostly if you have severe desaturations during your sleep. So it's going to show you severe sleep apnea, but not the mild to moderate. So I don't consider it a real good screening tool, um, but a lot of physicians use it because it's cheap and easy. Now, when you talk to physicians, again, we're entering their world. It's dental sleep medicine. So we kind of have to put on our doctor hats for a little bit. And so in doing that, we talk in AHI. That's how you determine how severe or, or even mild uh, someone's sleep apnea is. And that stands for apnea hypopnea index. The apnea hypopnea index is where you take the amount of apneas, and that's where they stop breathing for 10 seconds or more, and add in the hypopneas. And that's where there's the narrowing of the airway, and their oxygen desaturates 4%. And then you divide it by the amount of hours slept. So that gives us a number and a scale so that we can know how bad somebody is. And I've had a patient as high as 128. And we kept him on his CPAP because that is pretty severe. Now the RDI, that's another thing that people will talk about, and that's the Respiratory Disturbance Index. And that's where they add in the RERAS. RERAS stands for Respiratory Effort Related Arousal in which you're aroused to a higher stage of sleep, but there's no oxygen desaturation. So your sleep cycle is still getting disturbed and interrupted. Just like I had a patient who had an AHI of 7, but an RDI of 20, and they were very tired. And so we were able to get medical insurance to cover them. Now typically, this is what doctors will see. Someone who's overweight, old, a male, and has a large thick neck. Those are the ones that usually get diagnosed, but there are many who go undiagnosed. So in our practice, if we have an average you know, patient roll of 2,000, we have, in the, and 20% of the population has obstructive sleep apnea, and 80 to 90% are undiagnosed. And it's really because the physicians don't have time to look for it, and they've they really have had very little training just because in medical school they're covering so much more. Usually it's maybe half a day, maybe three hours of lecture in all of medical school that talks about sleep apnea. Now with that many undiagnosed, uh, we, there's even more people who have been diagnosed and are untreated. They're not using their CPAP or they just um, couldn't tolerate it or they did surgery and it didn't quite work. And so there's a lot of dentists, too, who make snore guards. There were a million snore guards manufactured last year. And that can be kind of dangerous territory if we don't have a baseline. If we make someone quiet, but they're still having apneic events, we don't know it because there's no follow through. And so we really need to make sure that we get a diagnosis first or a screening and make a snore guard for someone when they really, truly only have snoring. We are on the front lines, and the reason I say that is because we really do. We spend more time with our patients. We know them. We know their wives. We know their kids. Um, we spend more than, I mean, sometimes an hour with them, and we look at airways all day long. And now I've really trained my staff and my hygienists to look at these things, too. In fact, just before um, I went on this webinar, I, they knocked on my door to see if I could do a sleep apnea consult. So. It's everywhere you look. Now this is a patient that I've pretty much seen um, from day one in my practice. I've been practicing about 10 years. And Richard, lo I love it when he comes in. We like to two-step down the hallway. Uh, I've been kind of bugging him for years. Once I got my training, he was one of the first people that looked, popped into my head as, as having red flags for sleep apnea. But he was a little bit unwilling to hear it. Uh, he said he had other problems. And you know he has high blood pressure and diabetes. And he's tired all the time. And he even talks with a nasal kind of voice. This is actually a really good picture of him because he has uh, lost weight since uh, he's been treated. But I finally got him to a point where he was willing to talk to a sleep physician. He told me he was tired of being tired. And so we went and talked to him. And I said, you know, you may not be a candidate for an oral plant, but we want you to get help. And so he went to the sleep physician. He had a CPAP put on the night of his sleep test, and he has been sleeping 
wonderful ever since. I actually get gifts from him every time I see him. Now Sean is, <clears throat> again, I've been treating, uh, sorry, there's a little delay here. I've been treating his daughter um, and his family for forever. And Sean, he doesn't fit that profile. Remember it says obese, elderly, he is male. Uh, he's, he's 45 years old, even though he has the gray hair. He is a pharmaceutical rep, and he saw my sign out in the waiting room about touring. And he's like, you know, I started to have to sleep in the other room, and um, I noticed that every time I get on the plane, I fall asleep right away. And <clears throat> he's like, I didn't used to do that. And he thought maybe it's just because he's getting old. And when I looked in his mouth, I, you know, I saw a lot of the things that went unnoticed before when I wasn't trained to look for it. And we got him tested. He was actually able to do a home sleep test because he didn't have a lot of the other issues going on. And he had moderate sleep apnea. And we treated him with an oral appliance. And he takes it with him on the airplane when he travels. He doesn't have to carry that CPAP machine. And he feels awesome. And his wife, of course, is the happiest camper of them all. Um, so I do some external marketing as well as working with the physicians. And so one day, Cindy saw my ad in the paper. Sorry, she should be coming up soon. And she came because she had a lot of insomnia. And her physician was treating her. Sorry, it doesn't seem to be changing. We're seeing it just fine. When you 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 couldn't see there. Cindy, and I saw yeah. we saw it within a half a second. And we saw you went to the next screen, and we saw oh, it immediately. Oh, okay. So. so I don't know. Okay, sorry about that. Um, with Cindy, she came because um, she had been treated for insomnia with a sleeping aid, and depression with an antidepressant. She's actually an RN that works in our Panhandle Health District, and so she knows a little bit about health. And she came because she doesn't snore. It's that she has to sleep in a recliner because every time she goes to sleep, she gets a panic attack. So of course, her doctor wanted to give her a Valium for that. Well, come to find out, that was her airway narrowing and her, and her body's way of treating or trying to open up that airway. She would get these panicky type feelings. And so she has been now for a year, only two nights without her appliance. And that same feeling came back. So she can't live without it. Now, when we're um, screening patients, they, you know, some doctors have come up with different screening tools, one of them being a stop bang. And the anesthesiologists use this prior to um, basically surgery. So when they're putting a patient under and their airway is really relaxed, they can identify people they might have problems with. So the stop stands for snore, and T is for tired. Um, are you tired during your day? O, obstruction. Uh, have you noticed yourself stop breathing or has your um, spouse or anyone witnessed you stop breathing? And do you have high blood pressure? If you answer two out of four on the top part, then you have a really high correlation to having sleep apnea. And then on the second part, depending on how many you answer positive to, you have a, a chance for having severe sleep apnea. And the bang part is BMI, age, neck, and gender. This is something really easy to um, put in our health history. I know a lot of dentists that kind of add that to their paperwork to screen virtually every patient. Uh, the, this is the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, ESS, and this is the standard scale used. There's probably 10 out there, but these are the two most common ones. Now, this just tests how sleepy are you in certain situations. Now, if you answer eight or more, that usually means that you um, are overtired. I actually, I think I had like a 17. I, saw, I haven't seen the end of a rented movie in probably five years. I just think it's because I get up too early. Um, but when a patient does have, um, when they complain of being tired and they only have a score of six or seven, it's worth kind of going through the questionnaire with them because we did have a patient one time that I, you know, her, she was so tired and that was what she was complaining about. So when I went through it, she goes, well, I don't own a TV. So she had put a zero there. 
So some of these questions you do need to discuss with the patient to get a better idea. So when we're looking at a patient, as, as far as Dennis and us being on the front line, we have their health history. We have their medication list. We take their blood pressure. Uh, there's so many things that we do to help treat the whole patient, and there's a lot of clues in the mouth, one of them being a large tongue. Now this is Otis, and he actually has a AHI of 86. He was referred to me because no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't keep his CPAP on. He said he put it on, and the next thing he knew, it was off on the side of the bed. Now, with his tongue, you can see that it's folded in the middle. There's just, he doesn't have enough space for the amount of um, room allowed. And you can see he's not overweight, too bad. He's normal looking, but there was enough anatomical features that were causing an obstruction. In a scallop tongue, we see these quite often too. Especially when you're trying to do a, a crown on number two and the tongue still gets in the way, uh, that's another good indication that they may have an obstruction. Scallop tongue tells us that the tongue's too large for the amount of room allowed again. So the teeth actually cause indentations. So you can see different degrees of that. This is Otis's throat. And you can see, let me show you there, how beat up that uvula is. So there's no wonder he has severe sleep apnea. His tonsils aren't big, but his uvula is it's called a battered uvula when it's that swollen. In, in addition, his pharyngeal um, grade is really high too. And that's the amount, the width of that airway there. And you can see the pillars and the, or the walls really encroach upon that airway. Now, this is a good indication. When my husband and I play uh, who has sleep apnea at the airport, this is one of the telltale signs. Uh, this is Cindy on the right uh, that I told you about. She Basically, that means you have an inferior, inferiorly placed hyoid bone. And this is what we should look like. That is a nice cricohyoid space. Overbite. Uh, overbite tells us that the mandible is pushed back, that it's trapped back there. And along with the mandible is the attachments to the tongue and the throat. So if the mandible is held back, so are those muscles and so is the airway. Acid reflux. Um, I know acid reflux doesn't usually always present like heartburn. A lot of times we can question the patients. You know, you've seen those ditched out areas that are eroded. And even this is obviously a pretty severe example here. Um, but I think as dentists, we can see it first. When we ask the patients about it, I mean, it could be simple thing as acidic foods that they eat. Uh, I know in the Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of fruit and smoothie drinkers and health nuts. And so I do see this from foods. Um, but when I question patients about it, and they say, oh, no, I'm fine. I don't have heartburn. Well, it doesn't always show up as heartburn. Uh, I know I was finally diagnosed with it after I had a two-month chronic cough that any time I went out in the cold or if I exercised, I would cough and cough and cough because my the acid had affected the vocal cords and irritated them. In addition, you can have constant clearing of the throat <clears throat> if you know someone that has that or they say they have allergies all year long in that post-nasal drip um, begs the question to ask about acid reflux. One way to test it is to do um, Prilosec OTC for two weeks, once a day, and if it helps their postnasal drip, then um, that's a clue that maybe it was acid reflux. Again, I talked to you about bruxing, and that's a sign. That's a way um, our brain tells us to kickstart our breathing again. Again, a severe case, but we see this every day. And by doing a night guard, you actually are crowding that that space, crowding the tongue, and so it begs the question to ask. Um, before you make a night guard for someone, do they have other signs and symptoms that could they possibly be snoring and could they possibly have sleep apnea? Clencher, same thing. That's a, that's a way for our body to posture that mandible forward and open up the airway and pull that tongue forward. And mouth breathing. This is really common and as dentists, of course we see it because the patient's um, gingiva is all red and their mouth is kind of hanging open, and of course that plaque just dries on the front teeth. We see it a lot in kids. Sometimes they outgrow it. 
sometimes they don't. And we know how important that tongue pressure is to form that palate. And so early intervention in kids is really important. And we don't treat them all the time, sometimes with CPAP, but most of the time tons getting their tonsils and adenoids out and expanding the palate is a good way to prevent them from being adult apneics. And of course, we see it in adults, too. Uh, like I said, with the vaulted palate, uh, that tells us that as a, you know, they, as a kid, they weren't breathing right. Maybe they breathe right now. But uh, if you think about a vaulted palate, it actually impinges on the nasal component. So it narrows that passageway even more. This is a patient of mine. Uh, you can't get a good appreciation for how high his palate really is in this picture. But if you notice, his dentist, growing up, I don't, he couldn't afford braces. So in order to prevent that crowding, they pulled the premolars to try to help fit these teeth into that. And if you pull the premolars right in the stage where they're growing the most, you actually prevent that maxilla and mandible from growing forward too. And that's another way that crowds their way. And it's amazing to see um, in the petite women that I treat, how many have had their premolars removed. If, they have, if they're petite women, usually their airways petite too. And this is his lower teeth, and you can see how V-shaped that is. And if you notice too, when he, this is him open, his tongue falls right back. And a gag reflex, that's our body's way of keeping um, obstructions out of our throat. So I have, I have a couple patients that they're actually treated with CPAP, but um, every time I see their name on the schedule and I see x-rays, I say a little prayer for my hygienist because uh, it's really tough for them to get through that. Uh, but any time I see a gagger, I do. It, it just raises a red flag. It's not saying that they definitely have it or they're, they are diagnosed with it or anything. It's just all of these clues can tell us something. And again, we're looking at airways all the time. This is a nice airway. And this is something we can see in adult patients as well as our kid, kid patients. Now, in our kid patients, when I talk to the parents, I'll talk to them about um, you know, if they're six or seven, if they're still wetting the bed, um, if they have you know, bags under their eyes, they're called shiners. If they fall asleep real easy, um, because a lot of the kids who are sleep deprived fall asleep real easy. And, but I'll ask them, do they have restful sleep? Do they move around a lot? Are the sheets kind of crumpled up at the bottom of the bed in the morning? Uh, that's telling me that, yes, you may think they're sleeping eight, nine hours, but they're not getting good sleep. And just because kids' nervous systems are not real matured yet, it's kind of like when I give my two kids Benadryl. One gets real hyper, and one gets real drowsy. Because the nervous system isn't real developed yet, when kids are tired, they can get wired. So they are finding that ADD and ADHD are related to sleep. And again, in kids, the first thing we look at is airway. And when I ask the parents to talk to their pediatrician, I say, I tell them, I coach them, that we're not looking at sore throats. We're looking at the fact that they can't breathe through their nose and that it's affecting their sleep. So it's real important when we, do, when we talk about treatment options um, that there are more things than just CPAP or oral appliances. Sleep hygiene is easy. That's something to coach your patients on. Um, going to bed at a normal time, getting up at a normal time. Uh, if they're shift workers, trying to keep them on that same schedule. Uh, keeping electronics out of the bedroom, keeping TVs out of the bedroom. Uh, if you do wake up, don't go watch TV or get on the computer. Just do some, some nice quiet reading. Uh, these are all things that help get good quality sleep so that we feel rested in the morning. Uh, we need 7.7 .7 hours, and 40% of the American population gets five, hour, five hours or less. Uh, in addition, you know, the use of electronics and video games has caused a lot of us to be night owls. I still go to bed at 9. Um, in addition, if you are having trouble sleeping, going to bed in a quiet room, a dark room, even a little bit of light can affect our sleep because of um, circadian rhythms and melatonin release. One way to uh, stimulate natural melatonin is to take a hot bath and get into a cold bed. In addition, lifestyle modifications. That's in, that includes exercise regularly, but not too close to bedtime. Um, no smoking, no alcohol. Uh, alcohol actually 
you know, relaxes the soft tissue so much that it can cause a, um, even more crowding of the airway. And some people even say they snore only when they drink, and that's because it uh, relaxes the smooth muscle of the throat. Positional therapy. Some patients um, only have a closing off of obstruction when they're on their back. So keeping them on their side would be a good solution. The problem is getting patients to actually do it. Uh, we coach patients on it all the time, but they rarely follow through. Uh, one, one strategy is to sew tennis balls into the back of their t-shirt and keep them off their back. I know a Canadian that actually uses hockey pucks and places them um, in pantyhose and ties it around and places them right in his kidney. Uh, the bed wedge is a really easy one to use and probably the most successful. Uh, it's just a foam, basically, wedge that you can put under the mattress and keep it at a slope so that keeps you on your side. And of course, we have surgical options. Uh, it's really important to have an ENT that you can work with, um, an oral surgeon you can work with that get it. Uh, Again, with the children, uh, I'm not looking just at sore throats or strep throats. I want, it, I want tonsils or adenoids out if it's causing airway obstruction. And having an ENT that works with you is great. And a lot of times, um, they want to work with you too. They want somewhere to send their patients who aren't surgical candidates. And of course, we have a CPAP and oral appliances. So I'm going to look a little bit more into surgery real quick here. Uh, Nasal obstructions, there's a couple different ways to treat that. Uh, this is a deviated septum as well as a big turban, and you can actually get these fixed and allow you to breathe through your nose again. Uh, this is radio frequency uh, energy that is delivered beneath the surface of the turbinate, and then the treated tissue is heated to coagulate, and then over the next three to six weeks, the tissue shrinks. So, a lot of times we're hesitant to send our patients for surgery, but there are some out, like in-office procedures that can be done to help. Especially since oral appliances don't always affect the nasal area, we do need to um, sometimes treat that area as well. Of course, a simple tonsillectomy. This is a common procedure, um, not so common anymore, because what we're realizing is that most of the obstructions aren't in the soft palate and uvula area. Uh, this is most commonly re referred to as a U-triple-T. We don't always have to say uvulopalatal pharyngoplasty. Sorry about that. This is a patient I just hit, had in a couple weeks ago. Um, not this patient. This is right post-surgery. But this patient here, uh, you can see quite a bit of his soft palate and uvula are gone. In fact, he does have trouble swallowing um, in that area now. So he said that he's cured of sleep apnea. And I said, oh, well, what did your follow-up sleep study say? He goes, oh, I never had one. But since he doesn't snore anymore, he figured he was fine. But every time he comes in, he falls asleep in my chair. And so I, I said, well, let's just, do, let's just do a screening for you. Let's work with someone so we can just see what's going on. And he ended up having an HI of 43, and he thought he was cured. So it doesn't always work. A tongue resection, a hoyo suspension, that's another common procedure. Um, it's where we place a they place a screw in the mandible attached to sutures and wrap it around the hyoid bone to stabilize it. It doesn't always pull those muscles tight, but it helps prevent the collapse during their sleep at night. And a tongue resection, of course, is you're just taking out um, a section of the tongue to create, make it smaller. Genoglossal advancement. This is a patient of mine that actually, um, she, she was getting treated by, I forget, a dentist over in Seattle when she moved here, and she had an oral plant. And it shifted a few of the teeth that I had just worked on. And I was really upset by it. And so I sent her to an orthodontist. And he basically sent me back and sent her back to me and said, you know, breathing at night is more important than a few shifted teeth. And that's when I finally realized that I kind of had to get out of my dental mentality and look at the patient and treat him as a medical patient. So she actually ended up going in for genoglossal advancement. And that's where they take a block of bone, right where the muscles of the tongue and the throat attach, and pull it out, twist it 90 degrees, and screw it back in. Because she was petite and had kind of that turkey waddle look, this actually worked really well for her. And she did do a follow-up sleep study. Maxillomandibular advancement. Um, 
this is the most successful treatment, um, usually 90% successful, because we're taking the maxilla and the mandible and moving it forward 10 millimeters. So by doing that, you're not only you know moving, stabilizing the highway bone and all the muscles attached to it, but also creating more space for that airway. And you can see moving the nasal area forward too. This is actually a local patient. And of course, the 100% solution is to just bypass the airway altogether. Now CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. It doesn't give the patient oxygen. It doesn't supplement oxygen. It doesn't make their blood richer full of oxygen. It just blows enough air out to move the soft tissue out of the way. So the more blockages there are, the higher the pressure is going to be. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried one on or tried one, but it is a really weird experience. Uh, but for patients who are really sick or really severe, it's really easy for them to use because they feel so much better. It is the gold standard because it does work, but the compliance is really low. I'm glad you guys saw a better picture of me because um, I was. this was what I took in my sleep study. And there you go get that off of that screen. The compliance is low, but it is getting better. When I asked my um, local sleep physician what his compliance was, of course, he told me it was high 80s. And then you see numbers of studies that say 40%. So there's a huge range. And there's also a really liberal definition of what compliance is. A successfully treated patient is someone who wears their CPAP four nights a week, and of those nights, four hours a night. So they say that's enough treatment to get um, to lower their chance of comorbidities. But in my opinion, that seems like a really liberal definition because that is not a whole lot of sleep. Most of um, our patients actually wear their appliance um, all night. And when I ask them about their use, they say, oh, like they're embarrassed to admit that they take it out at like 5.30 in the morning and sleep till 6. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. I think that you got some good treatment there. <clears throat> it is getting better because uh, they have different nose masks or different uh, masks. Some of the common complaints are claustrophobia, uh, mask, the, le the mask leak air into my eyes and cause eye irritation or they cause sores on the bridge of the nose, um, or just, you know, they take it off and they don't know why. So the, a lot of times they can work around that or dry mouth. The, the humidifiers and the heated hose really do help. Uh, it does limit your sleep positions, though, and so that really bugs people sometimes. But there are even masks now where you can sleep on your side. And of course, why we're all here and how we can fit into the piece of the puzzle is by treating with oral appliances. So we prevent the collapse but also improve the muscle tone. And it's kind of counter counterintuitive because you'd think that by pulling that mandible forward, we're opening up the airway in the anterior-posterior way. But the way that the pharyngeal constrictors work, it actually opens up the airway laterally. Uh, in addition, by pulling that mandible forward, the pterygomandibular raffae, uh, probably haven't heard that term in a while, but it tightens up the um, palatine aponeurosis which is all of the soft tissue of the soft palate. And by tightening that, you actually prevent the vibration and prevent the snoring. So um, you, like I said, usually the patients are motivated to wear it to stop the snoring, and then they realize how much better they feel too. So there's different types, and those include the tongue retaining device, and that's kind of the, the grandfather, the place where we started, the non-custom boil and bite that you see um, on the internet, or the infomercials. Uh, this is the Pure Sleep that you can order online. It's buy one, get one free right now for $59.95. But you can see it's, you know, you boil it, bite into it, and you can actually adjust it a little bit. Non-adjustable, but custom made. Uh, this was made by uh, my, a patient that I've been treating. His friend is a dentist, and he said he'd try to just make him something to help him. And it was basically a couple mouth guards looted together. This is the TAP3. Um, it is now, as of December 26th, uh, approved by Medicare to use. Uh, this is good for patients that um, how need, are going to need a lot of dental work because you can use um, a material that is white, and when you heat it up, it turns clear, and then you can place it in the patient's mouth and kind of reline it. 
this is a Medicare approved Herbst. Um, most of the appliances at one point were actually approved by Medicare. And then as of November 1st, the Herbst was pretty much the only appliance that was. Uh, someone decided that the hinge was needed and that the rubber bands, um, elastic hooks were needed as well. So you advance it by turning the screw here and then you can advance the mandible forward. And again, just like when you um, take CPR training, if you need to get an airway, you hold the mandible down and forward. And so that's how we're treating our patients. Uh, Moses is a common appliance that is used. Uh, a lot of dentists like it because it is comfortable, but because of this anterior opening, the tongue actually postures forward. And so they think that's actual um, better airway opening because you're unconsciously pulling that tongue forward at night. Uh, you can, there's no way to kind of hook them together, but this is an Essex retainer on the top that um, glides into the appliance on the bottom. And by turning the screw, you can pull the mandible forward more. Uh, what I think is interesting about the Narvel is that it is created by ResMed. ResMed is the world's largest CPAP manufacturer and dealer, and so many DME um, suppliers are actually against oral appliances. They say they don't work, that anyone who comes and turns in their CPAP, they're making a big mistake. But now that ResMed makes an oral appliance, and I've told the DME suppliers that, they kind of go, huh. Wait, wait a second here. Maybe there is a place for oral appliances. Uh, it's a flexible material, and it's actually really strong. And you can change the um, the length of these hooks here to pull the mandible forward too. And I think it's CAD CAM milled. Okay, now um, real common one is the Somnodent. Uh, this is probably the one I use the most. Uh, because it's comfortable for the patients. I use the flex material and then I add elastic hooks so the patient can actually um, hold it together if they want to. If their jaw drops open and they get a dry mouth, then the, the elastics actually help kind of close it together. And it's um, small enough to get a lip seal. This is called the dorsal fin coupling uh, feature. And I believe there's the Respire is another one that kind of uses this um, technology. Uh, by um, advancing the screw, you pull this forward and the fin um, couples with it and moves forward as well. These actually are really comfortable. Uh, the patients think they look like vampire teeth, but they fit right up alongside the cheek and can't even notice it. Now this is my dad and that's my little sister. This is their, her 30th birthday party. Um, it's not his trophy wife, but I want to tell you his story real quick. Uh, he is a dentist, but he practices in another, in another town, and we went to the course together. Um, and part of the course, we did a home sleep study. And I just knew that I didn't want to share a hotel room with him because he snored so bad. Uh, but I'm cheap, so I ultimately did, and it wasn't a very good night of sleep. He ended up having moderate sleep apnea, uh, AHI of 25.3. And you can see that he snored even when he was on his side. That's what all these lines mean. And again, like I said, if once you learn this stuff, you'll be able to read this, no problem. All these blue lines are those raras, or those arousals. So he was not getting continuous sleep at all. The scariest part was his heart rate. It was a maximum of 137, and you can see how brachycardic it was all night long. His heart was working overtime when it was supposed to be resting. Now, the second night, um, he wore his appliance, and actually when he had sent in the impressions and the bite registration, he kind of arbitrarily set the bite registration. We didn't know how to do it correctly at the time. And so he, that night, went down to a 14.8. And as you can see, though, he, his heart was actually resting. He still has a lot of blue lines and a lot of snoring, but it is way better already. He is retronathic, and so we pulled him forward, titrated him, and now he's at a 5.1 and as quiet as can be. My mom actually thought he was dead the first time that it worked because she has never heard him quiet. And looking back, I see all the signs and symptoms that he had, acid reflux and a gag reflux, and everything that I look for in my patients was happening in my own family. So where do we get our patients? A good place to start, this is actually my partner. Uh, he's class two, uh, clencher, bruxer, headaches, 
everything you can think of. Um, so we actually treated him as well as my hygienist husband, as well as my assistant, as well as my assistant's husband. So um, you can see that's an easy place to practice or start. And it's an easy way to get um, fans, raving fans. And of course, with patients that you see, uh, the easiest ones are the ones that have already been diagnosed. So even adding, have you had a sleep study or have you been diagnosed with sleep apnea is a good place to start uh, because um, they're already not getting treated. Of course, you want to get all the training before you start to. Uh, your relationship with the medical community. Uh, this is something that has really helped take off um, the dental sleep medicine part of my practice. Like I said, I fell in love with dental sleep medicine, but I still get to do regular dentistry too, which I love. And this is something that can be done in a small town as long as, you know, I, and I've figured out a lot of the systems and the marketing and the communicating to help do that. The external marketing, of course, um, I'm real careful to never say that I want to replace your CPAP. Because I work so closely with the medical community, I don't want to say that oral appliances are the best thing ever and it's going to replace your CPAP that you're using. But we're, we have a lot of hunters and fishermen and campers and outdoorsmen. And so this was an easy um, ad just to show that you can have, you can use your CPAP at home but take the oral plants with you. I also market to snorers and, and write articles and all sorts of things. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine really opened this um, up for us. What they decided is that oral appliances are indicated for use in patients with mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. They found that in mild to moderate um, OSA that oral appliances are just as effective as CPAP and they have a better acceptance rate. So it's really beneficial to us that even the physicians say that. The problem is trying to get every physician in our town to agree to that. Um, I'm lucky in this area that I do, and I've had the chance to educate them and show them that it works and show them that I don't want to take over. CPAP still is the gold standard because it, um, oral appliances do have a more limited use in severe OSA and patients who have a high BMI. So before we do anything, um, we do need a sleep study. And the presence or absence of OSA must be determined. And that is probably the hardest part. That's why starting with people who just snore um, is a difficult place to start. But I'll tell you what, they are so thankful to you that you helped them do something that their own doctor couldn't do. Uh, do not make a snore guard for a patient without knowing first, unless you know that they are just a snorer. And you need to be serious about training yourself because there are a lot of nuances. There's a lot of um, things that you need to learn as far as medical insurance and um, background to what sleep medicine is and to dental sleep medicine. There's a lot of information out there and it's hard to sift through. Um, I get an email every day from someone wanting to do my marketing for me and they have you know, they want me to spend all this money with them and they'll guarantee me a successful dental sleep medicine practice. And I just think that there's um, easy solutions to that and I, I would like to teach you that. Um, with the consult, are they diagnosed or not? We show them um, different samples. We go over the informed consent. It's really important to have a risk, benefit, and alternative treatment. Um, we go over what obstructive sleep apnea is, their treatment options. And we go over their sleep study. Um, before they walk in the door, Crystal has already called on their medical insurance. We have a call intake form and an insurance verification form. And um, we have all this information before they even walk in the door. And when we go over their sleep study, what's amazing is that they've never heard any of that stuff before. It's so fun to educate them and um, show them what can be done for them. We do a cursory exam of the TMD uh, or TMJ airway, teeth, and perio. Go over side effects, uh, which can be bite changes, teeth shifting, TMJ pain, but not as common as you might think. Uh, some people charge for the consult. Some people do free. I um, actually do it for free. I did start out by charging and just found that it's easier to, to do it for free. 
um, a lot of times that consult appointment turns into the oppression appointment. At that time, I do a full exam and send letters to the doctors. It's real important to keep their, the doctors informed. Um, and it's also a great marketing tool because the doctors know that you're doing, you're following through and treating their patients right. That's all they care about. They just want to know they send the facts and their patient will be taken care of and followed through with from beginning to end. Um, so of course impressions, you need polyvinyl siloxane impressions or you could do a putty with a wash technique and the bite registration. There are four or five different um, ways to do it. I, I do the George gauge, uh, sometimes the Moses bite. So there are um, different tricks to that as well. And then we use Blue Moose to set it and send it to the lab. And then at the delivery appointment, we go over the informed consent again and go over the instructions, you know, keep it away from your dog and keep it out of the heat, uh, as well as morning exercises. Your jaw will feel different in the morning because the fluid fill, fills up in the joint. And just by even chewing on a simple piece of gum or giving them a morning repositioner or an AM aligner, uh, the bite goes back. Sometimes the bite, I have two patients that have um, a bite that shifted and I say, okay, well, we can just go back to your CPAP and they say, nope, I can live with this. I didn't even notice it. It's only because, you know, my dentist pointed it out to me. I didn't even, I didn't even know. So a lot of times the patient isn't even aware of it. I think it's funny that every time the patient leaves the delivery appointment, they always say, well, I hope this works. And then they come back for their one-week appointment or their two-week appointment based on our schedule because we do have some um, sleep apnea days that we dedicate straight to sleep apnea. Um, at that appointment, we, we ask them, when you wore it, how did you feel? And what's funny is they look at us kind of strange and they say, well, um, okay, I wore it every night. Was I not supposed to? And it's like, perfect. Nope, that's great because we just don't want them to feel like they failed if they did, you know, that it's not going to work for them if they didn't wear it a couple nights. So we show them how to advance it. Uh, we don't show them how to advance it at that delivery appointment because we want them to get used to it. And then by advancing it, um, you know, we can go from there. If they feel great, then sometimes we keep them there. I ask them to advance it until basically we start, you know, until it hurts. Um, we do have some patients that still snore and we talk about breathe right strips or, you know, nasal nose cones, things like that. Um, then we do a one month follow up. This is where it gets really fun because they're feeling so good and they're, you know, rolling along. And we start thinking about doing a follow-up sleep study at that point. And it takes about three months for the, that tissue to actually shrink down for those muscles to get toned again. When they're getting constantly beat up and battered, the tissue is real edematous and swollen. So it's about the three-month mark where they've been allowed to advance it enough. They've kind, kind of gotten over the side effects. And if they had any TMJ pain, they were, they're over that. So we do a titration, um, home sleep test. I actually didn't own a home sleep study for a long time. Um, because basically because of money. And uh, I finally did get one and because they are coming down in price and easier to, to use. Uh, I had sent a patient back for his home sleep study because he feels great and his wife was as happy as could be. And so I sent him back to the sleep physician. He did not advance it at all and his AHI was almost the same. So I am always sure to screen them before I send them back. I don't use my home sleep study um, as a screener before treatment or use it um, to diagnose. I only use it for the titration. And then we refer them for a PSG. And honestly, I've only had three patients do that. But I really do try to get them to do that. And so we're kind of getting towards the end here. The most important thing about doing this is it is so energizing. And you know, I love getting hugs after I change people's smiles. But I love, absolutely love, getting patient, uh, hugs from patients after I feel like they think that I saved their life. Um, I just want to read you this testimonial real quick. Um, sleep apnea, not anymore. I feel compelled to add my experience to those testimonials already submitted. This has been truly a life-altering experience for me. After being diagnosed, diagnosed with sleep apnea several years ago, I tried to adapt to the CPAP torture regimen. After repeated attempts with several masks and watching my wife's hair blow, blowing around lying next to me in bed, I finally gave up and just accepted the fact that it was just wasn't for me. So be it. 
Then last year, I was introduced to an oral appliance by Dr. Elliot and her fine staff. Now, many months have passed, and both my wife and I are two happy campers. No more waking up tired, no more falling asleep in the middle of the day reading, no more snoring. Oh my God, my wife has decided that she will no longer be looking for a new husband, and she has found that she can sleep without waiting for me to start breathing again. It has been a life-altering experience I never expected. This simple appliance is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And that is why I'm so passionate about it, because I want to teach others how to help the, you know, the millions of people that are undiagnosed and the, and the people that we can help that the, sleep, that the primary care physicians aren't catching. So I'm going to hand this over, and then we can answer some of your questions. Thank you, Erin. That was fantastic. You know, there's two things that I always look at to, to decide if the, if the webinar was successful or not. Number one, um, do we have a lot of questions? And usually if there's not a lot of questions, it means that people are so interested in what you're talking about that <laughs> they're not typing them in. Uh, we've only got about four or five questions, but I certainly would encourage people to ask questions now if they think about them because we've definitely left some time for that. Um, secondarily, you know, how is the attendance compared to when we first started? We actually have about 50 more people than we did at the beginning of the webinar. So uh, you, you definitely kept everyone's attention. I appreciate that. I think one thing that you kind of alluded to in the presentation is the fact that, you know, this the webinar is to get people excited about this, interested in it. It's not something that wasn't designed to make people experts in, in sleep apnea and treating it. Of course, um, that doesn't mean you have to go out and get an MD either. And I know that you do courses on this. I know you're doing one uh, with the, the folks at um, Golden Dental Solutions in the next month or so. So I've asked uh, Kurt Lawler, many of you have heard Kurt in the past uh, when we talked about physics forceps and other things like that. I'm going to turn things over to him to talk a little bit about Aaron's course and uh, a special offer for everyone on uh, tonight's uh, presentation. So Kurt, uh, the floor is yours and uh, tell us what you got to say. Okay, Lauren, I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Alley, great, um, great presentation. I really uh, enjoyed it and I hope everybody else on the line did also. Um, like Lauren just mentioned, at Golden Dental Solutions, we truly believe that in order for a course to be truly effective in translating the skills implemented into your practices, um, generally on an immediate basis, it really must have a, a hands-on component. A lot of our courses are live patient courses that we do at the University of Detroit Mercy uh, School of Dentistry here in Detroit. Uh, the reason we do that is because it allows you to practice um, on live patients licensing restrictions, and it's also um, a great state-of-the-art facility where you actually get a true hands-on experience um, outside of the classroom. And so as indicated, we are doing a course with Dr. Elliott on February 15th and 16th uh, here in Detroit, and we'd like to offer the attendees of the webinar this evening um, a discount with the promotional code of uh, SLEEP, so it's just S-L-E-E-P, uh, which expires on January 18th. And to learn more about uh, this course with, with Dr. Elliott that's being put on by uh, our company, Golden Dental Solutions, uh, you can visit goldendentalsolutions.com. And if you click on where I have the arrows indicated here on the slide for the dental sleep medicine section, or you can click, click on the alarm clock section over there that says help, uh, that will take you to some uh, a different section of the website that goes through in detail more information about the course. Um, the amount of CE credits, uh, the course fee, uh, and the general outline of the course. And again, I just wanted to emphasize this course is going to be really unique in the regards that on day two of the course, we are going to be spending um, a portion of the day down on the clinic floor at the university where we will be going uh, with Dr. Elliott over uh, in detail taking impressions, bite capturing for uh, different dental sleep medicine, uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of different appliances, bite capturing and impression methods. Um, we're not tied to a specific product. We're going to talk about many different brands um, and, and really provide a truly objective opinion for, uh, for doctors to learn. So uh, again, if you want to learn more about this course and take the opportunity to register online, uh, you can give us a call obviously here in our office at the phone number indicated on the screen, which is 877. 987-2284, or if you click on this section of the website here, it'll take you into the dental sleep medicine uh, portion uh, of Golden Dental Solutions, and you can click on registration, uh, sign up online, give us a call, more than happy to uh, answer any more of your questions. 
So I think at this point, um, I'll turn it back over to Lauren and, and, and uh, Aaron to go over the questions that you may have submitted during the webinar. And thanks again. I hope you can join us in Detroit. Thanks, Kurt. Um, and I do. One of the questions, I guess, is for you. And I, it'd be hard for you to say no to this. <laughs> I know it's not your policy. I want to ask if I've already signed up for the course because I knew that Dr. Elliot was so awesome. Can I still get the hundred dollar credit? I think maybe Aaron should give him the credit for that. I mean, that's <laughs> a very nice comment. Yeah, not a problem. Just uh, you know, whoever that is, they can just give us a call in the office. Not a problem. Okay, I'll send you the list of the attendees, so you'll you'll know who that was. Okay. Um, the other thing is, I know some people were, were curious about, uh, some people came a little bit late. Uh, just to remind everyone, I did record this entire webinar. Uh, you'll all be sent a link within the next day or two, so you can uh, listen to it at your convenience. Uh, Aaron, we got a lot of questions. Are you, uh, you ready? I am. Okay, well, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, I'm going to read them as I see them, but some of them, honestly, we're using terms I'm not sure I understand, so I didn't okay. this stuff when I did Perio. Um, for Medicare prescription form, in addition to the EO486 insertion, do you list each of the office visits? Um, for the Medicare, you actually aren't allowed to. We, we are considered a DME company. That stands for Durable Medical Equipment. So they look at us as if we're like a CPAP supplier versus the physician. So we kind of have to bundle our codes. That The Medicare reimbursement includes uh, the evaluation, it includes any radiographs, it includes the appliance, and it includes follow-up visits up to 90 days. Uh, sometimes you can actually charge out for repairs or um, maybe some follow-up appointments after 90 days, but I honestly haven't really done that. You can't even charge out for the home sleep test or titration study. Okay. I hope that answers um, the question. Right. I think so. They, yeah, they're still on the line, so they can do follow-ups <laughs> if they'd like. Um, you were talking about, uh, you showed a case where there was a patient that had a uveloplasty and they st were still falling asleep in the dental chair, and they talked about, uh, an, it was an HV43 or HIV43. What is that? The UPPP? Uh, they're saying something about H, oh, the question is something about HV or HIV43, so I'm not sure exactly what the, the question was. Uh, but we'll we'll invite them to maybe do a follow up for that as okay. well. Um, what about the uh, the phone? Oh, the H I. I'm sorry, it was the H I of 43. That means he still had severe sleep apnea. If you look on the scale of what H I is, that's the apnea hypopnea index. He was still oh. having residual apneas, or in residual obstructions, and not. But he was quiet, so he thought he was cured, but he wasn't. Okay. And you would say anything over 30 is not good, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Okay. The, um, the foam wedge, how is it placed? Is, it, uh, is the wedge right, left, or is it on top of the bed, higher than the foot? You know, wh where exactly are you putting that well, wedge? Well, there's actually a couple ways to do it. The bed wedge, um, I think they're made to just be put, like, under the sheet. But we found that if you put it under the mattress, it's a lot less noticeable, and it just gives you a little lift. You can find it on Amazon. It's like $40. Um, and if you have Amazon Prime like I do, you get free shipping. Um, or there's something called postural um, retro, or what is it, postural fluid shift that happens at night. And some people actually elevate their the uh, head of their bed just on some little elevators. They're made to elevate the entire bed, but if you just put them on the head of the bed, then you actually sleep at a little bit of an angle and you're, you don't get all stuffed up and your throat and everything doesn't take on the fluid that can narrow the airway and cause snoring as well. So some people feel a lot more refreshed and less puffy when they do that too. So there's a, there's a few strategies. Okay. Um, again, just some technical questions. How do you know that the mandible is forward enough if you don't have an HST device before sending back for follow-up PSG? You don't. That, and that's the trickiest thing is because I would go off the subject of symptoms, such as snoring, feeling rested, um, that sort of thing. Some people, though, they sleep alone. They're like, I don't know if I'm snoring. Um, and, you know, you're kind, of, you're kind of going blind. And really, dental sleep medicine doesn't have to be expensive to integrate. It, it doesn't at all. Um, and the home sleep study is probably um, one of the 
the most important pieces. And so I actually found um, a sleep study. I only have one. And I lease it for, I think it's like $350 a month for as many disposables as you want and free software that comes with it. So there's many different um, ways to do it, and you can do it pretty inexpensively. Okay. So I always, okay. I always do a titration check before I send them back to their physician. Um, let's see what else we got here. So we're, we're still on the topic of HST, so there's another question about this. Um, which, uh, which HST device do you use in your practice? Um, I actually use the watermark because the Aries watermark, that's the one that was on the head. And that is mostly because of the cost. I actually, because I have a partner, um, and he doesn't do sleep apnea. It's kind of like I'm permitted a certain amount of budget, <laughs> and so we kind of work within that. He does the implant surgeries, and I do the sleep apnea. And so that really fit nicely with my budget. There is other ways to do it, and um, especially if you can, and you can bill medical for the titration follow-ups. So if you are getting paid for them, then a lot of people use like the Watch Fat or um, the Braybon. Uh, Metabyte Junior. So there's there's a lot of them out there that can be affordable, especially if you're getting reimbursed for them. Okay. Uh, thinking about equipment, where do you purchase your bite gauges from? Um, you can get them a lot of places. Um, I do own a tap gauge as well as the Moses. You have to get the Moses from Modern Dental Lab. Uh, George gauge I can order directly from Somnimed. Uh, or you can just do a simple Google search and, and find it in, at a few different labs. Uh, I have a space maintainers pretty close to me, and they have them as well. But I just got them from Somnimed. Okay. What about the tap appliance? Any opinions on that? Um, you know, my assistant is kind of my guinea pig. And so I, when we first started, I made her one of everything. And uh, with the tap, you are kind of, there's advantages to it. Uh, but you are kind of locked in, and so you, it, some people even get a claustrophobic type feeling with it. Uh, so there are patients who do really well with it. In fact, um, I work with the Air Force Base here, and that's what all their dentists are trained in. Uh, I, it's just work, what works best for your patients and what works best in your hand. And I find with the Somni Somnimed, I, I don't have a lot of chair side time. Uh, or even with the Moses, or you know, there's advantages and to each appliance. The tap, like I said, is really good if you have uh, dental work that needs to be done. Okay, a couple questions here related to the same topic. I'm not sure how comfortable you are talking about this, but is there a fee range that you are, are comfortable talking about that you normally charge these patients, or or a national average that you've seen, or you know, however yeah. you want to phrase it. Uh, it's up to you how you you know what your comfort level. These are level great is. questions. Um, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, our audience the, is very educated. Yeah. Are, are, you know, yeah. What's interesting, of the difference between dent, dental insurance and medical insurance is vast. And with dental insurance, we, we know it's going to cost this much, and we're going to get reimbursed this much, and the patient owes this much. With medical insurance, you can charge up to, you know, I know some people that charge up to for the whole package with the evaluation and the radiograph and everything charge up to $6,500. But with medical insurance, you talk out-of-pocket expenses. You never really give a total. It's kind of like when I got my knee surgery, I said, well, how much exactly is this going to cost? And they kind of look at you with a blank stare, like, I don't know. Um, it's because there's so many variables, and there's adjustments and all sorts of things. So uh, when you talk to patients about their appliance, you talk out-of-pocket. I did have a patient I had to um, fix one, and it, he spent $4,000 in California for a $200 appliance. Um, I, I, I charge um, basically $2,700, or you know, I discount it for Medicare because um, we only get reimbursed a certain amount. So you can, you can charge up to, um, I've seen some insurance checks for $5,000 for the appliance. I'm not seeing that kind of number, those numbers here in Idaho. Um, I don't know if we're behind the times or just uh, our insurances are behind the times. So it can range. Are, are you submitting to medical insurance or are you just doing it through? I sure am, yeah. Health? In fact, I think that's one of the biggest things. And it's, it's what prevents us from doing it, you know, entering dental sleep medicine 
And medical insurance really is difficult to navigate. But once you get it, once I once it, Crystal was trained, then things were streamlined. And it wasn't until I started billing dental, or medical insurance that things really took off. I was maybe doing two appliances, probably three appliances um, a month, um, two and a half years ago, and I was having the patients try to bill, and they would have to pay me the full fee. Well, now you know I'm doing 15 to 20 a month because we d we take a lot of that load off for the patients and make it easier for, easier for them. And really, that's my goal is just to help get people sleeping again. Okay, so. If someone wanted to get started with this, you know, obviously the first step is to come to the course in Detroit. What next? I mean, what do they need to really be doing uh, to, to start incorporating this into the practice? Um, I think a good first step, like I said, is to start treating your staff once you, um, you know, learn it and know how to do the impressions and the buy registration and communicate with the lab. Um, treating your staff or, or even family and friends, but not treating them without um, sleep studies. I think reaching out to a sleep physician and say, hey, my dad or, you know, my hygienist um, is really struggling with their sleep and I'd like you to, I'd like to work through this um, case with you. And they really are open to it um, a lot of times. And they know that the dentists fill a niche that they can't. Um, because with medical insurance, it does have to be done by a dentist. I know there was an ENT that was trying to do it, do oral appliances himself too, but it has to be done by a dentist in most cases with the insurance companies. Okay, now where'd you get your training? I know you uh, you work with Kent, uh, you know, you said basically like a mentor type thing, or mm -hmm. do you have any formal training in this? Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I took an introductory course and there's always so much more to learn, new studies coming out, and so the AADSN is really a great resource. Um, that's the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. And they have a convention every year and in beginning of June. And so I went to Boston last year. I'll be in Baltimore again this year. And so that is a great resource to hear from the people that are in the research. You know, we're kind of on the front lines treating the people, whereas we learn from the people that are in the university and doing the studies. And it's really great um, interacting and great information. Okay. Now, Erin, typically we, we finish in about a couple of minutes, but we got a lot more than a couple of minutes worth of questions. I'm happy to stay around for another five, ten minutes. Uh, can okay. we pencil you in for that as well, or do you got to go? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Great. Yeah, no, I want to make sure people get their questions answered, and we're getting a lot of great questions here. Um, if you do not do a sleep study after delivery of the appliance, how sure are you that the OSA is treated? Um, you're really not. Uh, the sleep physician that I work with, I, I really am politically correct because I um, like working with the medical community. And that's why I'm so careful to not say that oral appliances replace CPAPs or, um, you know, come to me and I'll cure you of everything. But um, I do have a sleep physician who is who says that if they're mild to moderate, and they're not snoring anymore, and they feel good, then he doesn't require a follow-up PSG. He maybe will do a pulse ox just to make sure they're not severely desaturating. And that's if they have no comorbidities or any other problems. Um, but I always do that follow-up sleep study just you know, for my sake. Because we're dentists, I think we're type A. You know, it's like you see a cavity, you want to take it all out. And you want to make sure it's 100% and it's not going to break, all those things. Well, in the medical world, it's not so black and white. And so um, I want to see an HI under 5, but that doesn't always happen. But the patient it has a better quality of life, and even reducing their HI by half or under 10 is going to maximize their life um, by years as well as make it a better life. So um, sometimes you have to start thinking like a doctor and not a dentist. Yeah. Now, you had talked about the fact that when you do your marketing, you're really careful not to put down the, the CPAP. Um, is there any uh, thing in the literature out there that compares the CPAP with the dental appliances? Um, not a lot, but one of the, um, you know, there are a couple overview articles that are, like, um, that do compare different studies, you know. And they did find in one study that when treating mild to moderate sleep, um, sleep apnea with oral appliance, that they were 85% successful. Well, and so is the CPAP. 
but they found that the patients were way more accepting of the oral plants and preferred it. So that's what they say in the um, mild to moderate category. So, and that's the only study I've really seen comparing them. The other, um, when they have a severe patient, it's about 60% successful and a lot higher with CPAP. Okay. Um, do you believe the PSG is critical for diagnosis of OSA or CPAP before treatment? No, n not all the time. Uh, if a patient has a previous heart attack, if they have high blood pressure and strokes and, uh, you know, those kind of patients that have the health history a mile long, then, or they're severely, they have severe daytime tiredness and such bad insomnia that you think maybe they have a different type of sleep disorder, then I would definitely request a PSG, but most of the time I leave it up to the physicians. And my sleep physicians really are open to home sleep studies. And a lot of insurances are even going that way too, where they require a home sleep study before a PSG. So um, no, I don't always require a PSG because honestly, patients don't pursue treatment if they know they have to sleep in a sleep lab. And when you open it up to possibly having a home sleep study, they say, oh, well, I can do that. And it's amazing how many more people you can help um, yeah. in that situation. Yeah, that makes sense. When you're sending uh, adolescents, when you're treating adolescents, uh, can you guesstimate you know, what percentage are normally being sent for removal of their tonsils or adenoids? Of all the children I see? Or the, or, yeah, the adolescents, or the ones I guess yeah. that you're treating. Um, you know, most the ones that I send most of the time have their tonsils out because they're so severe. Um, I'd say, and again, I, I work with, a lot of times I bypass the pediatricians because they, again, they'll tell the pa parent, oh, they don't have sore throats, they'll outgrow it, they're fine. But I'm talking, I don't send four or five-year-olds unless they're really bad because uh, the, the surgeons really don't like taking tonsils out like they used to. And so when they're six or seven and still have that long face, that kind of, you know, type of look, um, then most of the time the ENTs are willing to look at it even without a sleep study. If the story's there, they sometimes bypass the sleep study and take the tonsils and adenoids out. And um, my hygienist niece actually just went and they put a scope up her nose and they saw her tons her adenoids for um, almost 100% blocking her nasal passageway. So she's going to get those out. Okay. Uh, a few more questions here. Uh, where did you get the Schwartz gauge uh, that you showed? The George Gage? Yeah. Yeah, it's just Somnimid. You can order them online from several different labs. Okay. Um, if someone doesn't have full-blown OSA, will these devices work for just to prevent snoring? Yes. And I do treat them in a little different way. So with snoring, um, insurance won't, medical insurance won't cover snorers. And so in, sometimes they don't even, I've had a couple of denials for mild sleep apnea, but you know, I could get into that more um, in the course. But uh, with the snores, I make either like an appliance that costs less, silent night. You know, like I said, we make those snore guards, but I know my patient is screened for it, and I know it's just snoring. So the silent night is common just because it's cheap, and so I'll just do it. Um, I think we charge $850 for that. Or I'll make them a, som a somnomed or a somnodent, and... Um, that it's, and I just charge a flat rate. As long as my um, lab fee is covered, I think we charge 1100 And the reason why I can charge so cheap is because there's no follow-up appointments. I don't have to do the follow-up home sleep study. I don't have to. We basically deliver it, show them how to advance it, and send them on their way. And there's not as much follow-up for just snoring. So you can do a couple different um, ways. OK. Um, we got a few more questions. And I certainly wanted to, to stress, and I know you're, you're being really modest about this, Aaron, but uh, the, really, the, the point of the webinar was just to give people kind of a, an overview of what, what's out there, what they should know about. Um, I would imagine that your course is going to cover pretty much all these questions and a lot more. It's a three-day mm -hmm. course, correct? Uh, two-day, yeah, two-day. Two-day course, okay. So yeah. there's a lot of information in two days, but certainly that was never the goal of the webinar is to get people to be 100% comfortable with it, and uh, I think the course would be a great place to start. Um, a couple of insurance questions here. If you don't know what insurance will pay you, do you request a part of the fee up front? 
Yeah, we usually do. Uh, like I said, when Crystal, uh, and that's like something that I would do with the course is give you the call intake form and the medical ver uh, insurance verification form. And it just kind of sets you up and guides you. And when the patient walks in, we know that their deductible hasn't been met and they're going to need this much out of pocket. Um, and so we usually rec we usually request at the at the day of impressions a six hundred dollar uh, down payment that'll cover the lab fees, and that's kind of all we care about. And so after that, if the insurance um, you know they need more, then we can collect that at the delivery appointment. It's it's really hard to convey sometimes to patients. They don't understand the thought of paying up front because most of the time, with, if you think about when you go to your doctor or if you have a surgery, you just kind of wait for the bills to arrive. But I think they can understand that you are investing in them ahead of time. So um, most of the time, they're pretty open to doing that. OK. Um, talking still on insurance, have you had any uh, experience dealing with insurance companies in Canada? I know that you guys aren't that far from Canada. Oh, yeah. You know what? I, I'm uh, really good friends with a Canadian dent dentist who's actually all doing dental sleep medicine uh, solely now. She sold her practice. And she, whenever it comes to medical insurance, she kind of tunes out uh, when we talk about it because it doesn't really apply there. And there's a huge waiting list uh, for the sleep lab. So I think she, I don't know how she's really doing it as far as with the health system, but she's working with a sleep physician now and has really made her life easier. OK. Um, this problem is probably a question for either you or Kurt, really critical question. Uh, will there be good snacks at the uh, course? <laughs> <laughs> I love some of these questions. I assume the answer is yes. <laughs> um, OK, there's a couple more here. Uh, kind of a long question here. Can finger pulse oximetry used with the Mueller maneuver revealing a high risk of OSA in a patient? Is it, is it enough? positive diagnosis to initiate treatment with sleep breathing oral appliance without a PSG? No. OK. There is not. The, the only test, radiograph, pharyngometer, anything, the only thing that they have seen work you know, to use as diagnosis is the PSG, the home sleep study, or a sleep MRI. And really, they only use that for research. It is not. It maybe show you you know, if they have a high probability, um, can be used to screen, but cannot be used to diagnose. That can only be done by a sleep physician with those sleep tests. OK. Um, with all the HMOs out there, if you're not a participating provider, can you still submit to those insurance companies? Yes. Um, and that's the trick. Uh, most dentists, I, I hope, actually, do not become in-network providers, uh, because they really uh, lower the fee quite a bit. Um, I am I'm in network with Blue Cross of Idaho only because um, I know the person that's kind of in charge of it, and they've had special you know meetings for me for this to try to um, get a, get me reimbursed at an appropriate rate. But um, if you are out of network, it just means the patient needs to pay more; they pay at a lower percentage, or um, you can get a gap exception because if there's no other dentist in a 50 mile radius that is not in-network, then a lot of times they'll cover you as an in-network provider, if that makes sense. OK. Uh, last question, and, and I'm sure you'll probably cover this in the seminar as, as well in your course. Um, is there any one external marketing method that you have found to be very effective? Obviously, it's going to depend on the area that you're in, but have you found good luck with print, radio, TV, social media? What, what do you find? Um, you? It does depend on the area you're in. And I'll tell you what, I love the marketing part of it. So I have all sorts of ideas. And I think it takes a few touches, you know what I mean, um, like seven touches before someone will actually pick up the phone and call. Um, I have a website, and I have you know, a, a Microsoft tag and a, and a QR code that leads to my website. But most of the patients we treat don't even have a computer. So you know, social media is good. I've been on the radio. And there's just um, so many things and so many different ways to approach people with it because it affects them in different ways. And so this is something I love talking about and have a lot of ideas and, and ad designs for, too. Well, I think but it's there's time nothing, to wrap not it up. one thing. <laughs> Good. Good to know. 
Aaron, thank you so much. I mean, just, we have great questions, great content. Um, I would highly encourage people to consider going to the course. It's in a month or so. You're going to learn all of this stuff and a lot more. Uh, you, you see the information on the screen. You can go to their website, to goldendentalsolutions.com, to use the sleep code. You can call them up. Um, we've had great luck working with Golden Dental Solutions over the years. Uh, they have, we actually have a webinar in a week or so on using the physics forceps. For those of you who are not doing extractions, it's because you find them very difficult. I think this will completely change your life. And I would highly encourage you, if you haven't gotten an invitation, send me an email. I'll be happy to get you a, an invitation. But we've already got a lot of people signed up for that one as well. Uh, thanks again to, to Kurt and Bone Dental Solutions for sponsoring the webinar and for making the course available. Uh, and they will be providing the, the free CE for everyone as well. So uh, thank you, Aaron. This, and I thought this was fantastic. And we really appreciate you being here. You're welcome. I had a great time. I hope people um, see the the need for it and the love for it as much as I do. Well, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic because it's something, as with a lot of the webinars that I do, that general dentists may not have gotten in dental school, but we absolutely have the skill set to be doing this. All you need is just a little bit of training, a little bit of confidence, uh, and you know, I can see the passion that you have and the, and the passion that your patients have in the in the treatment that you provided for them, and I think that's something we all strive for, you know, to have all these happy patients singing our praises, and what a great service, you know, if you can change someone's life around you. You don't typically get that with a, a two-surface amalgam, but uh, something like this uh, w would change their life. So I want to thank everyone uh, for being on the webinar. Stay tuned for future webinars. As I said, we have one next week with uh, Dr. Louis Malkmacher and Dr. Nazarian talking about physics forceps. Uh, we've got more coming up in the future as well. Um, Aaron, uh, do you give out your email address if people want to send you an email question? Oh, sure, that would be great. Um, it was, and I actually even showed it in the dental economics article, so I know I won't get too bombarded. Um, so it's Aaron Elliott, and if there's any Elliots out there, you know that you spell it with two L's and two T's. And it, so it's Aaron Elliott DDS at gmail.com. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for staying late with us this evening. We had a, it was a great webinar, and uh, maybe we'll bring you back in a few months. I think this is a great topic, and there seems to be a lot of interest. So um, thank you again, Aaron. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you all in future webinars. Good night, everyone. Good night.